So in this case, really what we are talking about, I think is a gap between how the complaints data is received and reviewed versus the risk management process where we have to look at that data to review for new hazards, new hazardous situations, new harms and update our risk analysis or other risk documents appropriately. I think that is the essence of this case. There's a gap. Hello friends, I'm Naveen Agarwal and I'm so glad to be back with you. Welcome to the weekly live stream. We will get started again every Tuesday at noon Eastern time. You can look forward to this live stream discussion on risk management related topics. Now this is not a webinar or a lecture and my whole purpose here is to engage with you, have a conversation and a dialogue. Now a couple of very quick points. This is an open forum. So please do not share any business sensitive or proprietary information. I request that you stay professional at all times, especially if you disagree with any of the comments or discussions going on. We are not here to debate or agree or disagree with each other. We are here to share information and learn from each other. And finally, nothing that we discuss in this live stream should be taken as regulatory advice. This is just for the purpose of educational experience and information sharing. Today we're going to focus on what lessons we can learn from an FDA warning letter. And I monitor these warning letters pretty regularly. It's a great resource for us to review our own process and look at it from the eyes of the regulatory bodies. What do they expect? And here's a chance for us to review this regulatory uh, action from FDA and see what deficiencies might be there in a risk management process. So first, I want to give you a brief uh, review of uh, what this device is. It's a modular uh, cooler heater, MCH, and the intended use according to this 510K is to supply temperature control water to heat exchange devices to help control a patient's temperature during cardiopulmonary bypass procedures lasting no more than six hours. As you can see, this is a pretty important device uh, because it maintains a patient's temperature during the surgery. Now, um, there was this uh, initial 510K in November 2010. And since then, the device actually has gone through a lot of different changes for the good. Very good innovations, uh, especially some of the safety led innovations to reduce the risks. However, they have not really gone back to the FDA with a new pre-market request. And that was one of the points that the FDA made in this warning letter that they consider this product to be misbranded because many changes in FDA's view would have required an FDA 510K notification and, and a review. Uh, but we're not going to go into the regulatory side of it. Let's look into the some of the observations that are relevant to us. So here's the observation of interest and they are siding it against the complaints procedures. So the issue is your firm received complaint DI 138886 on January 29, 2021. Let's pay attention to the dates because here's a key point in this, which alleged biofilm buildup in the tubing of an MCH device. Now keep in mind, this tubing is supposed to have an antimicrobial coating and there's a biofilm formation. The risk assessment section of this complaint record states no change in risk as the device did not malfunction and no new risk identified. However, your firm's current risk matrix dated June 11, 2021 does not identify biofilm growth. Additionally, risks associated with bacterial contamination were not added until April 1, 2021. So there's a timeline here that FDA is observing a gap in their risk management process where incoming information from complaints is not being reflected in the risk analysis. So why does it matter? Let's look at the timeline. Initial complaint about biofilm buildup was received in January 2021. Until April 1, 2021, risks associated with bacterial contamination were not identified until that point. And even until June 11, 2021, specifically, risk of biofilm growth still not identified. 
Now, let's talk about biofilm for those who may not be familiar with it. It's basically a surface coating by microorganisms, plain and simple, which means that it presents a hazardous situation where bacterial or other microbial contamination can occur in the system or in the operating environment. So this presents a risk of infection. So as you can see from the timeline, FDA is noticing that no action has happened. Additional signs of gaps in the QMS or risk management that are being cited in this warning letter. Complaint procedure requires a review of complaints against risk analysis procedure. However, no clear instruction on frequency. So we don't know how frequently these reviews are happening or if they are happening at all. There was a gap of nearly six months until that time the risk matrix has not been updated. So this is an issue. Now March 5, 2021, during this time frame, a complaint was received involving patient infection, but there was insufficient follow-up. July 28, 2021, 11 complaints of bacterial contamination of NCA on these devices. However, the investigation was not sufficiently done according to FDA because they did not identify the level of contamination or cause of contamination. There are some related issues. Inadequate risk analysis in design controls. They are aware of a new hazard of bacterial contamination, but they are not considering it appropriately in their design activities. They are unclear on design inputs for cleanability. There are other examples also, but here are some of the key points. Insufficient inadequate validation of design changes. For example, one of the innovative changes they made in this device was to install a hood that deflected the air which could contain aerosolized particles of water contaminated with microbes or bacteria. This is to actually reduce the risk. However, they did not validate that appropriately. They just looked at ability to control temperature or not. So FDA is questioning the validation method, the validation strategy. Inadequate kappa investigations actions for device linked infections. They are hearing a lot about device related infections, but they are not really investigating them in good detail. And as a result, FDA is finding deficiencies in their kappa process as well. So let's look at what the requirement is. ISO 14971 2019 requirement actually is pretty clear in clause 10. The manufacturer shall review, shall is non optional. The information collected for possible relevance to safety, especially whether one, previously unrecognized hazards or hazardous situations are present. In this case, it is very clear. Presence of biofilm should have been recognized even at the design stage, the possibility of that. But it wasn't. And when they receive information from complaints, it is new. So it should be recognized and reviewed. An estimated risk from hazardous situation is no longer acceptable. That's another scenario. When the probability of harm or the severity of harm has changed. So we have to re we have to review that. The overall residual risk is no longer acceptable in relation to the benefits of the intended use. The generally acknowledged state of the art has changed. Now if you look at this warning letter at a big picture level as a whole, really FDA is questioning the safety and effectiveness, the balance of benefit versus risk. So many changes have happened. They have not submitted to FDA all the information for a review for a new 510k possibly they have not really followed up on complaints so FDA is questioning their risk management process and how effective it is in their quality management system to ensure continued safety and effectiveness that is the whole point and if you implement ISO 14971 appropriately and effectively this process should work so I want us to consider some of these best practices but in the meantime Please continue to share your thoughts and ideas on this case or a related case, your related experience, uh, what other ideas or suggestions you would make. But here's what comes to my mind at the very high level. We have to establish a process separate, a safety surveillance process separate from complaints handling. Here's my experience. Typically complaints handling departments are overwhelmed with the amount of work they have to do, managing complaints intake evaluating them, investigating them, and looking at them from a reportability point of view. They are overwhelmed. 
So there has to be a separate process that looks at safety surveillance. And you could integrate that as part of your post-market surveillance process if you have a procedure. And in most cases, I've seen a procedure separate from complaints handling. So you can integrate that. But it has to be a separate business process. It should align and work very closely with complaints handling. But it should have clear roles and responsibilities for who is going to do what. Now, in this case, they did have a requirement of analyzing or evaluating their complaints against the risk analysis procedure. They just did not specify enough details in terms of frequency of evaluation, who's going to do that, what will be the outcome, and what next steps should be taken. So the process was, was there, but not adequately defined. Establish a direct link between outputs of risk management and design controls via design inputs. This is very important because that is how you build the whole relationship between the risk management across the life cycle and post market gets connected with design. This is how it happens. So it has to be explicitly defined and traced. Adopt a risk based approach to Kappa investigations and effectiveness check. Now, we, we do Kappa for many different reasons. For, for quality issues, for safety issues, for other issues. But when it comes to safety and risk of harm, appropriately, we have to assign uh, a risk-based approach. ISO 13485 also talks about a risk-based approach. And the effectiveness of the CAPA has to be evaluated correctly. So in this case, FDA has questioned their CAPA effectiveness related to infection-related items. Finally, Define timeline expectations clearly and monitor closely. So this process has to work in a very standard routine way. And that is why it is a separate business process from complaints handling and reporting. You have to put together a team, but if you are a small to mid-sized organization, maybe you don't have the luxury of having too many people, too many resources. So you have to find a way to, uh, to develop a process that will look at your complaints data in a very organized, structured way and make these de decisions so it has to be linked to the other operations in your quality management system appropriately so risk management really in practice becomes quite challenging and the reason it becomes challenging is because it has linkages to almost everything that you do in your quality management system it touches almost every operation it touches a lot of people and it's the linkages that we have to understand clearly and define clearly Saurabh, you have a comment here. Having a monthly, quarterly PMS data review and robust trending process is essential to ensure the risk matrix and ORR are checked. Absolutely, I agree with you. Frequency should be aligned with your process, the scale, the volume, the type of complaints. If you are a global company, products going everywhere and high volume, you have to do it monthly. But if not, you can do it quarterly. So take a step back and see what might work for you. Try a few things and be able to change. Surendra, you have a follow-up comment here. We have some opinions that we can wait for PMS report PSUR to get input for risk matrix update. But the frequency for PMS report and PSUR is from one year to three year based on device class. Yeah, so do we wait that long? What is appropriate for us? PMS reports, PSURs, regulatory requirements. You have some frequency based on what your approach is to meeting those regulatory requirements. That doesn't mean that you have to wait that long. You can create a process and I'll share with you my experience with you. I actually helped develop a safety surveillance process which had a monthly frequency. It, it, that frequency aligned well with the complaints volume we had. You could have a quarterly frequency, it doesn't matter. But you have to have a frequency which is appropriate to the volume and the type of complaints you are receiving. So you have to have a review frequency which is aligned with that and then output of those reviews can determine actions. And at the end of the year or two, three years, you update that information into a report for regulatory purposes. So it has to be a multi-phase, multi-step process that could work for you. Carolyn, you have a comment here. I'm used to urgency in risk management in complaints, CAPAs, etc. Is it sufficient to show progress in risk assessments, hopefully less than six plus months? I don't think there is a magic number in terms of the frequency. Frequency of review and action, actions should be appropriate 
to the type of organization and the type of product you have. Even within the same organization, some products may require a more frequent review, some may require a less frequent review. Mature products versus not mature products. So that variation we have to be mindful. And if we are effective resource managers, we will keep that in mind when we design our business processes. So if we proceduralize that every month we have to do something, we'll be forced to do it, not effective. So before we proceduralize anything, we should be mindful of these factors. But thank you for raising that point. Okay, so we have a comment here from Ricardo. Thank you for sharing this. Establishing a comprehensive training plan for employees involved in complaint handling and surveillance could help bring awareness into the issue. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, just look at, look at all the responsibility that, that your complaints handling staff has. My experience is that generally, generally speaking, these departments are overwhelmed. Now, complaints are coming from many different directions and not all of them may be um, safety related complaints. They also handle complaints related to customer satisfaction. Depending upon your complaints volume and the nature of complaints, this staff may be overworked. And that's a point I wanna emphasize is look at your resources, look at what they're responsible for and the level of work they have. See how else you can manage this, but treat this as a separate process because complaints handling by itself is a very complex process. In the, in the US and other parts of the world, we also have to report adverse events and that reporting is quite complex too. Ricardo, follow-up comment, review the decision tree for determining significant changes versus non-significant to make sure there is no ambiguity. Okay, so great point, will help you prioritize. But what is significant and what is not significant? How do we define that? Now, one option could be to look at the severity of the potential outcome. And we're gonna focus on the safety-related aspects for a moment. If an adverse event is likely to contribute in the future to a safety related event that's reportable right so as a prioritization you could look at your reportable events and see if they will necessitate a change in your risk matrix new hazards new hazardous situations new harms right and then you can look at the complaint trending data to see if the severity or probability of those harms is also changing so you could prioritize based on adverse events you could prioritize based on other factors as well but laid out clearly what factors would you consider as significant versus non-significant if you leave it to interpretation that's where you have this problem because sometimes it can be done in a correct way and sometimes not and sometimes you have a you might have a gap so going back to this case that we just discussed certainly they were aware of microbial contamination that's why they innovated and they had a antimicrobial coating on a on a tube they would not have innovated if they didn't worry about it. So they knew. Still, there was a gap in their process of not following up in an appropriately urgent, with an appropriate sense of urgency. That was the main issue. Savita, you have a point here. This biofilm was not addressed during the initial later phase of risk analysis. Does this mean if any risk is missed during RA, it can be updated later when any such kind of complaint is received. Absolutely, it can be updated. Nobody is expecting perfection when you get out of the gate. What, what is expected of you is a process that works effectively, which means it's an ongoing process. Risk reduced to as far as possible doesn't mean that there is a benchmark or there's a gold standard. Of course, if you know more about your product, you do the most you can, the best you can. You learn from similar products in the past, but it's a brand new product. You don't know much. What I advise people to do in that scenario, have a more aggressive post-market plan for that product, which should be different from your other post-market safety surveillance plans. So you go out, you go out with the best case scenario of benefit risk, but you continually improve it. Absolutely, you can continue to improve it. What is not acceptable is knowing that it should be done and not doing it in a reasonably timely way. And what's reasonably timely? It's up to us to define based on our particular situation. So yeah, it's not, it's not black and white. And unfortunately, that is where we have to kind of exercise some of our judgment and experience. Uh, I will take one last comment from Sergio. 
Qualified people with a correct decision tree to review and understanding the complaints is key to prioritize product performance issues that may represent a risk. Absolutely. So I think we are aligning that we need good people and I'm sure we have a lot of good people. I, I know of all companies, they hire the best. We have the very best working in our industry. They are competent, they are professional. What we work, need to work on is a process. And I want to keep emphasizing the word process over and over again. Process has to work. And we have to be willing to change the process. Decision trees can be used. I try not to make things too prescriptive or too restrictive because I personally rely on the creativity and passion of people who work in our companies. And I work with those people. I see a problem when the procedure is so black and white, so prescriptive that it leaves no room for anything else. Now you might say, hey Naveen, that's all fine and dandy, but what if people don't do the right thing? I would like us to question that. I think we need to put our trust in people and help them achieve the goals that our organization wants. And that's what we can do as leaders in QA and RA. So I want us to keep thinking about that. That's another topic for another time. Uh, let me try to summarize what we have talked about so far. Now we took it up as a warning letter as an example, right? This is just a way to get started. Great source of information. Uh, I really, really urge you to look at warning letters if you are not already doing that and learn about where the deficiencies might be in your process. So in this case, really what we are talking about, I think is a gap between how the complaints data is received and reviewed versus the risk management process where we have to look at that data to review for new hazards, new hazardous situations, new harms and update our risk analysis or other risk documents appropriately. I think that is the essence of this case. There's a gap. There are other gaps too where it is not the risk management process is not fully integrated with the design control process or the CAPA process but primarily the gap is their review process is not working very well. So that's where we need to focus our attention on. But I want to remind us, let's not create too many processes for the sake of processes because our resources are already overwhelmed. I know of no company which has extra resources waiting for more work to do. Everyone is stretched thin. So as quality and regulatory professionals, it is our responsibility to help our organization utilize these resources most effectively. So let's keep that in mind. There is no shortage of methodologies. There is no shortage of advice where we have to work hard and only we can do it because we know our organizations better than anybody else is to take all that information and put it to use in the context of our organization. And that is where some strategic thinking has to take place. I want to leave you with some other resources that you may take advantage of and those of uh, some of you may have heard them already, but here's a website. Uh, I, this is my learning and development website and also a community website. So I have, I'm trying to create a community of professionals that we can engage with each other. Here are some free stuff for you and there are two you can uh, take advantage of today. I'm offering a free template for hazard analysis with follow-up videos that will teach you how to use that template, some best practices and some points of confusion to avoid. And the second free offer is to join my knowledge sharing community. More than 150 people have already joined and we have a very good dialogue going on. So if you are not there, I encourage you to join. It's free and it's completely a closed group. I moderate that and I keep really a close eye on how we are managing our conversation there. So all of it is highly positive and the more we engage, the more we can learn from each other. I invite you to browse this website for some of the new courses that I'm offering. There's a coaching opportunity. So take a look at all those. Reach out to me anytime on LinkedIn and let's continue our conversation. I will see you next Tuesday. Thank you for watching.